thank you again for agreeing to meet with us and taking the time. Uh, we just came from the exclusive in-person premiere of the MS in Black and African Americans documentary, uh, which explores the experiences of Black and African American people living with MS. So MS was long believed to primarily affect white patients, particularly women. But recent studies indicate that in the US, Black people, particularly Black women, may be more likely to develop MS than people of other ethnic backgrounds. How does the typical MS presentation in Black patients differ from patients of other races and ethnicities? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. So oftentimes, the presentation can be similar, right, to other people living with MS. But we do see a higher prevalence of symptoms like optic neuritis, visual problems. Um, we also see more uh, spinal cord dysfunction, so more mobility or movement issues very early on in the course of MS. Um, sometimes we also can see what we call a multi multifocal onset, meaning someone may have multiple symptoms at the start of their MS in African-American populations. And what about in terms of disease progression? Yeah, so disease progression can occur twice as fast in the black population versus the white population. Um, we also can see more walking disability, um, meaning people may have to use a walking assistive device up to six years earlier than their white counterparts. And what are some of the health inequities experienced by black patients with MS, namely in terms of diagnosis, routine clinical care, and treatment access. So there's still a need for awareness in the general community, whether it's the general neurology community, or even in the primary care community that MS does occur in black people. Um, I think that's still a huge unmet need. I have people that come and see me who um, said their doctors didn't think that they had MS because they were um, of a different ethnicity. Um, so I think there's a need to educate in that regard. Um, other health inequities um, include access to care, um, knowledge about resources that are available to help assist with their care, whether it is um, funding to help with medications or to help with things like MRI or other costs associated with um, having multiple sclerosis. Um, and then I think also in terms of advocacy, so knowing that you can advocate for yourself and seek care in other places, second or third opinions, if you're not getting what you need. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done to improve um, health outcomes in uh, minority populations. And on that note, what changes do you feel should be made to eliminate these gaps or close these gaps uh, in care for Black patients? Yeah, so there's a lot that needs to be done. <laughs> but I think first steps are, number one, educating the broader community that MS, that anyone can get MS. So I think that's the first message that needs to be very apparent. Um, I think there also needs to be education for primary care physicians, so emergency room physicians, Primary care doctors are often the first people that encounter our patients that have symptoms and may, you know, misdiagnose um, or not direct people to get MRIs. Um, I think another thing is that we want to empower people living with MS. Um, we want to empower people to know the symptoms, when they should go to see a neurologist or get checked out. We want people with MS to know they should try to see a specialist, um, you know, uh, at some point during the course of their um, condition, and that also they are their own best advocate. And a lack of representation in clinical trials has been cited as one reason that Black patients face these health inequities in the chronic disease space, including with MS. What are some of the reasons for the lack of Black participation in trials, and how does this lack of participation contribute to health inequities? Right. So I think when we talk about low participation in clinical trials, it's important to kind of reframe that a little bit, because when we use the word participation or low participation, it kind of puts the onus on the person that they don't want to participate. It kind of is a, a conclusion in a way. But really, it's low enrollment. There are systemic barriers, right? There are inclusion and exclusion criteria issues where we may um, automatically exclude populations of people like minorities who have more comorbidities, right? And it's not really scientific, right? Um, I think we also have to think about um, the fact that there are a large number of costs associated with clinical trial participants. You have to take off work. Um, somebody has to, walk, there has to be child care. Uh, for some people, elder care. Um, they may be missing, you know, uh, other financial responsibilities. And so how do we make trials more accessible? 
Um, you know, so there are systemic barriers, there are barriers um, institutional wise. And I think also we need to make sure that we're building trusting relationships in communities and with trusted community partners to raise awareness about the importance of clinical research and many of the safeguards that are in place to prevent people being abused or prevent unethical studies from being done. And I think you touched upon this in your answer there, but what are some ways that we could address this issue and boost um, diverse enrollment in clinical trials? Absolutely. So there are a lot of ways to do that. So I think, number one, we need to really renovate the way that we do clinical research, right? Um, we need to look at um, the way that we prepare protocols. There needs to be patient input into some of those scientific study designs. Um, I think also we need to make sure that we're educating um, our colleagues about the importance of diversity in clinical research, as well as educating the patient community about the importance um, of participating in the benefits of clinical trials, um, which help the community and also contribute to our scientific knowledge. How many African-Americans are living with MS in the U.S.? And Given that MS diagnoses may be more likely to be missed or delayed in these communities, do we think we really have an accurate number? So, no, I can't give you a number. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's a quick one. Um, I know we know that at least close to a million people in the U.S. have MS. Um, we know the incidence and risk are highest in Black people, but we really don't have accurate numbers. Like there's some studies that ballpark anywhere from 15 to 30 percent of the population may be African-American, but we really don't know. Has there been any recent progress toward improving MS health equity in Black communities? And if so, what are some of the most exciting advances that you've seen and how do you expect they will impact the lives of Black MS patients? So I'm excited about many things, right? Um, I'm excited about, um, you know, a clinical research study that focuses on Black and Hispanic people with multiple sclerosis. Um, I'm also excited about the documentary uh, that we did today um, because it will raise awareness and highlight the voices of people with co people of color living with MS um, and allow other people to see themselves and hopefully begin to advocate for themselves and also have hope that they can live well with MS. Um, there also is the African American Registry. Um, so there are many projects that are really trying to address the disparities. Um, we certainly have a long way to go, but we've come a very long way as well. And in the next 10 or so years, what changes do you hope to see that might make life easier for Black patients? So I would love to see the creation of um, communities of support, um, because in some cases the support may be a little bit different, um, you know, depending on where people are in their, you know, lifespan and also kind of their cultural backgrounds. So I think that that's important. Um, I would also love to see a clinical trial that has adequate numbers of enrollment um, from the beginning where we don't have to do another study on the back end to explore these populations. And then I would love um, for us to have more epidemiologic data um, where we can really understand how many people are living with this disease and how can we look at um, ways to directly impact um, and improve healthcare outcomes. And finally, what message do you hope people who are watching the documentary will take away from it? I would love for people to take away um, a sense of hope, right? I would love for people to feel seen, to know um, that they are not alone, and to see, you know, people talk about their experiences with MS and how even though they may have had to pivot and shift some of their goals, they're still living well and thriving um, and, you know, uh, having that support, um, you know, that's really needed to live well with this condition. Is there anything else you think is important to mention as we discuss this topic or anything you'd like to expand on? No, I think we, I think we covered it. I, I think so. Okay, yeah. great. Well, thank, thank you very you so much, much for your time. Thank you guys really so much. I really it. appreciate it.